So we have arrived at the question and answer part of the day, which can be a lot of fun. <laughs> and um, and I appreciate I appreciate your questions. And Bhante Sudaso and I are going to do a little uh, tag team here, just totally spontaneous um, sharing. And I think we're both up for that, so we'll give it a try. So, I'll just go through the questions in totally random order. Great. First question, that pasta was amazing. What's the recipe? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, sit down and meditate some more. <laughs> Actually, I'm wondering too. An answer? <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm wondering too what the recipe is. You're wondering too what the recipe is. Okay, more meditation for you too. <laughs> Um, I read about five cycles of 500 years each. I can't read this one word. Something, Buddhism, is approximately 3,000 years old. Are we in the fifth cycle? It was written that Buddhism, among people... Oh, I think I can tell what the question was. ...will decrease in the fifth cycle. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, the question was, if I read in one of these books that the Buddhist, Buddhism will increase and then it will decrease in the fifth cycle and even in the fifth cycle, people can attain enlightenment, mm -hmm. but I just feel that the Buddhism is increasing, so it was like, I felt that it to be, I didn't understand it, like how can it be, yeah. how can we be in the fifth cycle? So, so my understanding is various schools have different interpretations about cycles of Buddhism. Um, and there's, there's basic cosmology as we find it in the canon. There's also, that's different than this. Um, this thing about 500 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, it depends on which school there are various interpretations. Um, Oftentimes you might hear in the Mahayana the age of Mapo. Mapo means that, that period when there's the teaching but no real practice going on and therefore no real possibility for awakening. And to that I would say that's actually contrary to the basic teaching. The basic teaching is that, as I've been saying for the last 36 hours, that what the reality that we awaken to is this reality that we are living. So it must be possible. Yeah. More thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing I would add is, so in terms of the, the statement of 500 years, so it's important to recognize that when you come across large numbers in the Buddha's discourses, they're not to be taken literally. Yeah. So the Buddha used the number 500 so frequently and in so many places that he can't possibly have meant exactly 500. Okay. Um, so it was probably a literary device, well, not literary because it was spoken, but like a, a way of speaking that just means a lot. The same way we say, oh, I have a thousand reasons for that. Mm -hmm. We don't actually mean 1,000, we just mean a lot. So we do find this statement, um, uh, for example, in the suttas of one place, the Buddha says that Buddhism would last for 500 years. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't literally mean 500 years. He just means that it's not going to last forever. It's going to last a long time, but not forever. Like everything else, it's finite. Okay. Uh, it lasts for a period of time, and then it dies out. And there's no Buddhism for a while, and then another Buddha arises and starts teaching again. So we don't know how long it's going to be. Um, so now it's been about 2,600 years. Seems to still be going strong. Yeah. So, yeah, don't take the numbers too seriously. Great. Next question is, do you still have a bodhisattva vow? Presumably that question is for me. <laughs> and the answer is yes. I, I um, have not set down any of my Zen vows. I've 
taken some additional precepts, training precepts in the Theravada. Um, and that said, I, um, I think for me there is uh, some process that's happening about how, how to understand the Bodhisattva vow. Um, so to be clear, also many people don't know that the Theravada, both the Theravada and the Mahayana have a Bodhisattva path of an understanding the Bodhisattva um, path. And, um, and, those, and those two understandings in modern times are quite different. But from what I can tell, historically it was not always so, not so much. And um, so then it comes really down to um, am I practicing for the benefit of all beings? I'm still practicing for the benefit of all beings. I don't think there's, that's ever been in question, no matter what I'm wearing or where I'm sitting, that's not in question. <laughs> I think that's enough for that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this next one, maybe you want to read that one. <laughs> this says, I don't quite understand being mindful, being in the present and letting go of the past and future thought, which would make us suffer. Uh, but if we don't think about those suffering elements, we can't make a plan to fulfill basic needs of life in order for the mind to be in the present and at peace. Uh, what is your thought? Did you want me to answer You want to go first Please? and then... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, There's a number of ways to approach this. Uh, first off is recognizing that you are always in the present. You're actually never anywhere other than the present. Uh, so when, when we talk about letting go of the past and future, uh, what that's actually saying is letting go of your concepts of past and future, because actually you're never in either the past or the future, you're always in the present. But it's recognizing that in order to clearly, deeply understand the subtler layers of mind, then we need to get past the coarser layers of mind. We can't be, we can't be caught on the less refined layers of mind. So of course we need to, to understand the coarse layers of mind, but generally speaking we already see them quite clearly all the time anyway. Well, we see them all the time. Clearly <laughs> is another issue. <laughs> we see the coarse layers of mind all the time. So. What we really need to explore is the subtler layers of mind. So, uh, as far as making plans to fulfill basic needs of life, um, yeah, you still do those things. Uh, so when you need to go to the doctor, you make a plan, um, next Tuesday at five o'clock, I'm going to go to the doctor. That's perfectly fine. Um, being in the present moment doesn't mean that you stop making doctor's appointments. It just means that you're in the present moment when you're making your doctor's appointment and you're in the present moment when you go to the doctor and so on. Uh, what's more worrisome about this next question is this idea that fulfilling the basic needs of your life is necessary for the mind to be in the present and at peace. That is definitely not true. So uh, I remember uh, early in my days at, at Abhayagiri Monastery, where I did most of my training, there was this lady came, who came and she'd been coming to Buddhist monasteries for decades. And she said, she comes to monasteries so she can be cold, tired, and hungry. <laughs> uh, and, and I can't wait, stop and think about that. It's like, well, actually, in your ordinary day-to-day -day life, it's very easy, um, assuming you're not in abject poverty, it's very easy to not be cold, tired, and hungry. It's very easy to get enough to eat all day long whenever you want it. You just go and open the fridge. Um, in monasteries, it's not so easy. You have to face these things. What does it feel like to be hungry? Can you be okay with that? What does it feel like to be cold? 
or hot? Can you be okay with that? What does it feel like to be tired? Can you be okay with that? So it's training the mind to always be at peace, no matter whether or not you think your basic needs are being fulfilled. It's like, I'm hungry. That's okay. I'm still happy. I'm cold. I'm sick. But that's not a problem, unless we make it a problem. Um, so it's, it's looking at the mind. It's looking in each moment, how am I making myself suffer right now? And how can I stop making myself suffer right now? And the answer is not to raid the fridge. The answer is to let go of your desire for raiding the fridge. <laughs> yep, so when I practice in Japan, to this second point, when I practice in Japan, I realized very quickly that it was going to be like that. That it was going to be a question of who is it, what is this thing, when none of my preferences are met. None. Not what I wear, not what I eat, not the time of day that I get up, the temperature, the people I'm hanging out with, nothing. Is it still possible to thrive? And what is this thing that's there, that's arising, that's manifesting in that state of completely not getting my preferences met? So it teaches you that that stuff that you think you absolutely have to have is actually just that. It's just stuff. These are things outside of you. Even when you're dying, you can actually find your peace of mind. Maybe. So also that this, this um, question of being in the present Um, yeah, as Bhante said, you can't be anywhere else but in the present moment. And we don't just forget about the consequences of what we do in the present moment, right? So we make plans, or we take an action, or we say something, or we do something with our bodies in this present moment. And that's going to determine how much suffering we're going to have. Okay, if you don't, I'll if you don't, if you don't take it, that's fine. Yeah. I, it's a follow-up for that, but sure. maybe I can write it down then. Or, or will you take my question? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Well, that wasn't my question, but the basic needs of life, um, you know, uh, I heard uh, preferences discussed, and I heard uh, you know, being content with a lack of luxury, but you still have the basic needs met in the monastery. You know, even if you're cold, you're not freezing. Even if you're tired, you're not being driven to death by exhaustion. So I'm, I don't feel as though the question was actually answered. And the question that comes to mind for me is monastics, they rely completely on the generosity of others, but in the monastic code, if you know, if food is not forthcoming, if robes are not forthcoming, if shelter is not forthcoming, from the generosity of others, then are you supposed to die because you can't have it given to you? Or Well, if you're actually asking about Vinaya, the answer is no. The answer is, if you actually are dying of starvation, then you can ask. Uh, even if you're sick, and you need particular kinds of food for your medical condition, you can ask for those particular things. So the Vinaya actually has a lot of exceptions for extreme circumstances. Um, so then if you're... But that's, I just want to... So I, we're not going to allow a follow-up question to that. Okay. But let me just say one other thing, which yeah. is that's the reason why I brought up dying also. Sorry? That's the reason why I brought up dying. Because you can be dying 
and still be practicing and still be experiencing peace of mind. And actually we need to be able to experience peace of mind in those circumstances. Um, in the Sabhasava Sutta, the Buddha said that we should uh, patiently endure even sensations that are life-threatening. Mm -hmm. um, because someday we will experience the sensations of the body dying. And if we lose our equanimity at that time, well, what's our practice good for? Well, I wouldn't go going. quite that far, but <laughs> <laughs> if you lose your equanimity at that time, I'm sorry, I feel compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because it does happen. It's a very, it can be a very confusing, very difficult time, very painful time. Can I say something? No, we're not going to take any more questions on that question. <laughs> Done. It, it was no. Okay, Done. <laughs> stack? We have the stack to get through. We have a stack to get through. <laughs> Are we avoiding eye contact during this retreat? So I didn't specifically mention that. I don't think that it's in the guidelines. But um, I was actually trained that way, to avoid eye contact during retreat. Not, and, and that sounds, that's a, kind of a funny way to put it, actually, also, avoiding eye contact. It's not like that. It's more like I, I keep um, visually contained. I keep <coughs> my focus of my practice as contained as I can when I'm on retreat. <coughs> so, in my opinion, no, we are, we are not avoiding eye contact on this retreat. If people want to practice that way, you're welcome to practice that way. I found it quite helpful, actually. Um, in the same way that sometimes we tend to fill in silence with a sense of something ominous or a sense of somebody sliding us or a sense of coolness which may or may not be there because silence is really just space in the same way when we're making eye contact with people there's, there are expectations there are communications or miscommunications there are any number of different things happening there so it's not bad it's just adding more complexity to something that's not necessary. Do you want to add something to that? Um. Yeah, actually I would say that during retreats, there's, for the most part, there's not really need to communicate uh, with others to any extent other than, mm, I mean, of course, watch out for others. Observe when you're in their space or when you're uh, observe how you're impacting others by your own physical presence. But there's little or no need to communicate with others. That's part of why retreats are set up the way they are, where you don't really have to think about anything or worry about anything, um, except your own practice, following the schedule and doing the meditations and coming to the talks and all that. Uh, so you don't need to communicate with people except in extreme situations. So. Yeah, you can say a lot without ever opening your mouth. So look at that urge to communicate uh, and see what's that coming from. Is that coming from <coughs> loneliness? Is it coming from a sense of isolation? Is it coming from uh, a sense of uh, agitation? Or, or what is it? Where is this urge to, to connect? Where is that coming from? Uh, and can we, can we drop that desire and cultivate contentment? Uh, so this is one of the major elements of Buddhist practice, is cultivating contentment with things just as they are. So right now you're not connecting with anyone. Can you be content with that? Actually, that's just a practice you can do at any moment in your life, any moment of any day. Just ask yourself, can I be, can I be content with this? Whatever this happens to be, can I be content with this? And if you can always answer yes to that question, then you'll always be happy. How about you read that one? Uh -huh. How can one avoid attachment in a loving relationship? <laughs> 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 
I can go first if you prefer. Uh, no, I can take this one. <laughs> you know the thing of like the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other? So the devil on the other is thinking of various contemplations that we do in monasteries. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go for the direct bluntness of this one because it's kind of fun and it's Buddhist. Um, <laughs> every single person you know is going to die. So whoever you're in a loving relationship with, it's not that there isn't a loving relationship. Of course there is. But like everything else, it doesn't last. Eventually it comes to an end. One of you is going to die. Actually, both of you are going to die. But odds are pretty good. One of you is going to die first. So it's just reflecting on the utter self-destructive futility of attachment. Oh. <laughs> it's like, seriously, why would you do that to yourself? Uh, and that's not that we don't do it, because of course we do. But the more we reflect on the futility uh, and misery of attachment, uh, the more we let go of it. Um, it's only because we, uh, we're fixating so much on the pleasantness of the relationship that we're not noticing the drawbacks of the attachment. And, and these don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. You can be in a completely open-hearted, loving relationship with somebody and also be totally okay with it coming to an end. So loving somebody does not mean attachment necessarily. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why we experience so much relationship-related dukkha is because we have such a hard time disentangling love and attachment. But actually, they have nothing to do with one another. They're not... Uh, yeah, they're not the same thing. They're, they're completely separate mind states. They're completely separate mental attitudes. So that's one thing I recommend, reflecting on the impermanence of that relationship. So one of the things the Buddha said we should reflect on every day, and this is actually whether you're a monastic or a lay person. Uh, he said whether you're a monastic or a lay person, whether you're a woman or a man, um, every day you should reflect. Everything I love will change and be separated from me. So the point of that is just so you recognize this is the nature of all things. I don't need to fear this because it's inevitable. And as long as I don't make my happiness depend upon this relationship, then there won't be a problem. There's nothing wrong. Which we actually talked about earlier today already, mm. at one point. And I would like to add one more perspective on this, which is that if you can be in a relationship with someone and know and allow for the fact that they are a changing being from moment to moment, then you will have real love without attachment. Then you can actually relate to what's really truly going on there and relinquish it when it's time to relinquish it which is actually moment to moment. Next up. Okay. Let's see, there are two questions here. Um, first question, how does the practice of Brahma Vihara lead to concentration? Second question, how do you decide what method to practice at any given time? So, maybe I'll answer both of these and hand it to you. Sure. Okay. So the practice of Brahma Vihara is, uh, so there's, again, there's four of them. Um, and I'm actually most familiar with practicing the first one and the last one. Uh, so practicing loving kindness and practicing equanimity. I haven't done a tremendous amount of formal meditation practice of, of the other two. Um, so loving kindness meditation, the way I was taught, and the way I normally practice it is focusing on a feeling or a mind state or an attitude. So that's an object. 
so from a Buddhist standpoint, any discrete thing is an object, whether it's physical or non-physical is beside the point. So focusing on your hands is an object. Focusing on sound is an object. Focusing on loving kindness is an object. And whenever you hold the mind steady on a given object for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. then the mind develops concentration. So once you produce loving kindness, hold the mind steady on that feeling of loving kindness, and the mind will become uh, immovable. The mind will become imperturbable. The mind will attain uh, focus, stillness, samadhi. Um, and equanimity, I would say, equanimity is a necessary quality for deep concentration of any sort. In fact, it's, it's spoken about in the higher stages of jhana as being a necessary component to the higher stages of jhana. Uh, so eventually equanimity becomes indispensable one way or the other. As for the second one, how do you, how do you decide what method to practice at any given time? There's actually two ways that I approach this. One is to look at my mind and to see what is the dominant defilement or dominant hindrance currently present. And then I use a technique that is the antithesis of that. So if I'm feeling a bit grumpy, then I'll do loving-kindness meditation. If I'm feeling scatterbrained, then I'll do concentration meditation. Um, for example. Um, on the other hand, if I'm feeling that my mind is in relatively good condition, like I don't have any strong defilements present, and my concentration is going pretty well, uh, then I'll focus on developing insight. Um, and so what insight technique you use depends upon what, what works for you. Uh, and that's, again, it's something that varies from time to time. So as you learn more and more meditation techniques and get uh, familiarity with more and more meditation techniques, you'll also start to get a sense as to what techniques will be most effective at any given time. Um, and sometimes you'll try something and you'll do it for a few minutes and you'll just be like, wow, this is not going even remotely close to well. <laughs> and then you have a couple options. One is to keep at it anyway, which develops the qualities of perseverance and willpower, which are great qualities to develop. So this is actually a very important thing. So even if your meditation practice is going terribly in the sense that you're not getting what you think are good results, the mere fact that you keep trying is developing wholesome mind states. It's developing perseverance and willpower, which are necessary for any meditation to work. So it's still worth it, even if you feel like you're wasting your time. The mere fact that you keep trying means you're not wasting your time. Um, and the other approach is if you recognize a technique is really not working and you've been doing it for several minutes and you're not getting anywhere, then do something else. Switch to a different technique. <coughs> Um, of course, you don't want to be jumping around for the whole period of meditation. You should settle on something within the first few minutes and, and stick with it, in my opinion. Um, but it's fine in the first few minutes to, to switch around a little bit and to see what, what feels right for that meditation period. Another very important thing is to periodically go and talk to meditation teachers, people who are experienced practitioners, and tell them, this is what I've been doing, this is what's been happening, do you have any advice? You don't necessarily need to take their advice, but it's still good to listen because they might say something useful. So those are my thoughts on those questions. Okay. How does practice of Brahma Viharas lead to concentration? In addition to what Bhante said, I would add that it's a, it enlivens the mind, it brings joy, it's a positive, and so it's actually also easier to keep the attention, to keep the mind focused on these things when, they're, when there's a positive feeling about them. Um, Venerable Analia talks a lot about adding a little bit of joy to the breath so that he could keep his mind on the breath because the breath is such a neutral um, object that he had a terrible time with it in the beginning. He said he just had a really terrible time learning how to do that. So when we, when we bring our focus to something which is pleasant, 
then it's also easier to maintain that continuity of focus that is necessary in order for concentration to develop. And I would add about uh, Karuna and, and, uh, and Mudita. So we hear a lot about compassion. It's a season of compassion right now, to some extent, helping others who are less fortunate. And, and we have plenty of opportunities to do that, to uh, wish that people have less suffering in their lives and have more peace and joy and actually act on that. Um, so I would say the practice of compassion, really take it off the cushion. That will help your concentration greatly because you can experience pomoja. We're going to talk a little bit more about pomoja, but it's a kind of happiness that is based in reflecting on the goodness that you're doing. And then uh, finally, Madita which is gladness, or it's kind of empathetic gladness, gladness for other people's gladness. It's a source of absolutely um, <laughs> infinite amounts of happiness. Right? If, you want, if you only feel good about when things go well for you, then the difference between that and feeling good about when things go well for other people just the sheer <laughs> mathematics of that, folks. Think about it. <laughs> so again, it's a pleasant, it's a pleasant object. It's very, um, very useful for helping the mind to stay engaged. Because for many of us, the vitaka, the part of bringing the attention to the object, is something that we can do. But the vichara, which is the maintenance of the attention on the object, takes a little bit more effort, takes often a lot more effort. And it's a place where people often struggle and it takes the time to develop. And so helping yourself out by having these pleasant objects is very useful. And then in terms of um, decide what method, so I would say, you know, for myself personally, um, um, things have shifted over the years quite a bit. Um, for a long time, I had two practices, two primary practices. One was shikantaza, is what we would call in Theravada, choiceless awareness, or simply sitting aware of each perception as it comes into the field of awareness, each thing. This is the, the sit that we did last night. Um, and a koan, which is what is this moment? And if you stop for a second and you think about those two practices, they are the same thing. What is this moment? And choiceless awareness of what's here, right now. So that was my practice for a long time, for many years. And it was good, and it was a good practice for me because I experienced such a tremendous amount of variety <laughs> in that in that form of practice that I stayed it was very engaging even doing the same thing for a long time but nowadays I have a different a different repertoire so I also said a while uh, uh, earlier today that I've been practicing that uh, for about 12 years now on a daily basis and um, and that's been ongoing. So I don't really think about it. As soon as I can remember, as soon as I'm conscious of being awake in the morning, I practice metta right there, first thing in the morning. I don't really choose whether to do it or not. 
<clears throat> Same thing at night. I try close to the last thing a day, as close to the last thing of the day as possible to do a little metta practice. In fact, recently I realized that when, when I have trouble falling asleep, oftentimes it's because I have forgotten to do the metta practice. It's like now that's, that's part of the, the end of the day, of allowing the mind to settle to the point where I could go to sleep. So, so there is a benefit, I'm, I'm putting in a plug for not making a choice. Just committing yourself to a practice for a period of time and really, really seeing how that can grow. How that can expose you to different aspects of your own being. And then more, in more recent times, um, I've actually also been finding that the mind inclines to deeper states of concentration, so that is something new that I've taken up in the last several years, and that's and that deciding how to how and when to do that is uh, like that kind of a process of exploration. I kind of gauge whether I think that the energy. It, the, the certain kind of energy that's needed for that is present. So, I really, um, I really hope that you, as Bhante mentioned, develop some persistence about your practice. It's so easy, especially because we have the opportunity to be exposed to so many wonderful teachings and so many different types of Buddhism. And I think that's wonderful. And I also think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't really go deeply in our practice. So really, really do that. This question says, I lived rather unskillfully for many years. Although I've made a lot of progress, I find that I get beset by remorse of wasted days and years, especially now that my grandma is sick at 88. How can I forgive myself? Mm. Have tears, I think is what it says. Yeah, so, so compassion doesn't just apply to other people, you know? One of the things that practice is going to do is it's going to show you your shortcomings. It's going to show you the gaps between your ideal and your actual. Right? <laughs> that is happening. If that's not happening, I would ask you to take a harder look. <laughs> So what you do when you see that gap, though, is very critical, right? If you're harsh with yourself, if you beat yourself up, if you drag yourself through the mud, when you see that gap, then guess what? Then you will start turning away again because it's just too hard, because it's just adding more suffering. I have seen people do this in their practice. Please don't do that. When you see that gap, be kind. Be kind. I'll tell you a funny story about this. I was at Tassajara, and I was responsible for this job where we put the trash can, it's multiple things around the monastery in the evening to get ready for everybody going to bed. And one of them was putting the trash cans that were in the dish area into the actual shack so that the raccoons wouldn't go through them in the evenings and then at night. And then, before the meditation in the morning, you bring them out again, the trash cans, okay? So that was part of my job, and I put the trash cans away in the evening, and then the morning came, and I totally spaced it. I just forgot about bringing the trash cans out. And there I was in the morning, sit, and I, I realized, oh, 
I didn't get them out, so I'll have to go after the sit and go take them out. So I get over there, and somebody's already taken the trash cans out. And I think to myself, this person thinks I'm incompetent. I can't believe it. They didn't even give me a chance to do my job. Like, okay, I get that I was late, but this is, I can't believe this. Why did somebody do this? They could have just let me do it. And, right? And then the thought occurred to me, I'm going to go to the work meeting and I'm going to complain. I'm going to say something about this. Because I don't know who did it and I could just say it at the work meeting where everybody is. And then I imagined myself actually doing that. <laughs> And that was what I call the oh sweetie moment. <laughs> I imagined myself standing in work circle complaining about somebody having helped me with my chore, which I forgot and was late with anyway. And I thought, oh sweetie, look at what you're doing. Look at what you're doing. <laughs> So I encourage you to have your oh sweet moments. <laughs> really. Really. Because that will help you to see, to keep seeing them. That will help you to keep looking directly at your delusion. Do you want to add anything? No, no, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next one. Um, yesterday, with respect to reading books during the retreat, you stated, I stated, try not to fill up the space, all the space with activities. I almost wept. I felt like so much of what I do in life is to fill up the space. How can I not do that? Mm. These days I think it's very easy to fill up the space with so many things, huh? Just even having a cell phone is very tempting. So it's just continue. In fact, I saw this absolutely horrifying study about people who voluntarily gave their cell phones away to the study scientists and they had the option of so they were going to be giving the phone away for 60 seconds and they had the option after 20 seconds to press a button which would give them like a little bit of a jolt like a little bit of a static snap in order to get their phone back faster <coughs> which the scientists thought nobody would actually do. And in fact, like 60% of the people did to get their phone back 40 seconds faster. So when I hear things like that, I think, what is it that we are so afraid to sit with? What is it that seems so scary or so overwhelming that we can't sit still with it. So what we're doing here is helping you to learn how not to do that. That's part of what meditation is all about. Just that simple. Don't fill it up. Don't fill it up. And know that when we say that, it sort of has a basic assumption in there <coughs> that there's some empty space. But as I said earlier, your whole life is effort. There is something going on all the time. If you're bored, it means you're not paying attention. Honestly. <laughs> Honestly, right? Because we are always receiving 24-7 by definition being in a human body means you are always receiving activity, sensory perceptions, things going on at either a subtle or a gross level. So there's always stuff. So this kind of, this kind of 
mindlessly engaging in, in greater and greater activities is actually, I think, again, is a turning away from actually wanting to be with what's present. And it's also losing touch with your intention. Right. So the Dalai Lama is very famous for getting up every morning and reciting his intention, his practice intention. I'm fortunate to have woke, I don't know it exactly, but it's something like, I'm fortunate to have woken up today. I want to use this life for the benefit of all beings. I want to use this life to wake up to the true nature of all things. So really, stay in touch with your intention. That will help also. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> you get the next one. Okay. Yeah, you did two home runs in a row. <laughs> Let's see. How does Buddhism integrate the concept of no self, or selves not existing, with being an individual who has choice in this lifetime, along with individual karma? So there's an underlying assumption in this question uh, which is uh, the assumption that the apparent existence of uh, a ma uh, the apparent existence of an object that we call choice necessitates that there also exists a mm, permanent ongoing essence of being. I do not see where this premise comes from. It seems absolutely unfounded. It seems absurd. Uh, so, when we talk about self in Buddhism, namely the thing that we don't have, uh, so <laughs> what we mean by that is a unchanging <coughs> essence. Mm -hmm. So, something inside you or outside you or within you or around you or something related to your body or your mind something that doesn't change. Something that you could point to and always say, that's me, no matter what. You can say, that's me. Think about it like your name tag, maybe. Like it's it, your name tag, it's always there, somewhere. There's always that thing that, that this is me. This is me. So the, the basic principle of, of not-self, I mean, there's, there's many ways of approaching the, the the doctrine of not-self in many ways of practicing with it. But one way is simply to recognize that there's absolutely nothing in all that you call me. There is nothing that can be found which doesn't change. Um, so one way I, I talk about this is if you were to go through your body and mind and label absolutely everything in your whole body and mind right now with your name, like you put your name tag on absolutely everything in your body and mind, wait a little bit, look again and you won't find your name tag anywhere. Every single thing that you labeled me a moment ago is, is gone, it's changed. Um, if that's assuming that your attention is very refined, then you'll notice that everything's changed in the course of a moment. If your attention is less well refined, it might take a few minutes or a few days or maybe even a few years to recognize that everything has changed. Uh, which is where, this is one place where actually thinking of the past can be really helpful. Uh, some people find that in the beginning with contemplating not-self and contemplating impermanence, which these practices go together very neatly, uh, that it's actually quite difficult to just immediately go to recognizing uh, it in this immediate moment. But then thinking over the course of years or decades, thinking, who did I think I was 20 years ago versus who do I think I am now? Is it even the same person? And we boil it down to usually a few basic things which are still the same. But like I think about myself 20 years ago, um, radically different person. Um, very little is the same. Very, very little is the same. And even the things which, which we might call the same are actually quite, quite different. They're similar, but not exactly the same. Um, so that's more what we're talking about, is that 
uh, when you look, you can't find anything which is ultimately you. You only find a bunch of changeable things, conditional things, things which come and go depending on the circumstances. So one of those things is choice. Uh, and so in every moment, we have the ability to make choices. And in fact, in every moment, we're making choices. Um, even thinking, I'm not going to do anything in this moment is still a choice. So every single moment, there is a choice that is made. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is an eternal, unchanging being which makes choices. It just means there's a choice that is made. Um, so it's also recognizing that these choices that come and go are also not ultimately who we are. If a choice was ultimately who we were, then we would make that exact same choice all the time. But we don't. We make different choices at different times. Um, so one moment you choose to be happy, the next you choose to be sad. Uh, one day you choose to take the bus, the next day you choose to take the train. Uh, so clearly choice is not who we are, it's just more temporary, changeable, conditional things. Um, so I, I really don't see how a choice necessitates the existence of, uh, of a soul or a self or some ongoing essence of being. Similarly with individual karma. Uh, so karma is just cause and effect. That's all it really is. It's just causality. So karma is just talking about how the conditions of one moment shape the conditions of the next moment. That doesn't mean that there's an uh, eternal essence of anything. In fact, karma is ultimately it's the process of change. And since everything is constantly changing, then there is nothing that is eternal. There's nothing that is unchanging. Um, so the manifestation of karma actually is a direct, in direct opposition to the concept of self. Uh, let me see that to this one. The only detail that I would add is is. It ties back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier today about consciousness as being momentary. Right? So consciousness arising out of contact between sense organs and sense objects and that um, we have the impression that there's a continuity there that is not necessarily real, right? It is also equally changing from instant to instant. So, where I'm going with that is then it doesn't negate that there is some consciousness that can make a choice, and that consciousness makes a choice, and thus karmic consequences then unfold. But it's a different consciousness in each moment, yes. making a different choice in each moment. Yes. Yeah. And they tend to hang together. Right. That's where we get the stream. The stream of karmic consequence that then becomes reborn. Okay, you can maybe get down with Yay. two. Yay! Can you please share some mindfulness practices for young people? I work with students from the ages of 10 to 14. Yeah, the same ones that you use for old people. <laughs> um, though I have to put a disclaimer on this, I'm not good with children. <laughs> um, I like them in small doses for short periods of time. Um, but when it comes to teaching them anything, I'm an utter failure. So I'm, I'm fine with teenagers, in my opinion. <laughs> I might have a different story. Um, in my opinion, I'm, I'm fine with teaching teenagers. But under that, I, I have a really hard time. 
communicating anything effectively. So I'm, I don't think I'm actually the best person. <laughs> but just from, a, from the standpoint of principle, it seems that ultimately we're all dealing with exactly the same thing. Whether you're young or old, it's the same greed, hatred, and delusion. Whether you're young or old, you need to develop uh, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Um, so the way which we communicate these things might vary. Uh, actually, now that I think about it, I remember the very first time I tried to teach uh, mindfulness meditation to a little girl. This was long before I even went to the monastery. I was 19 at the time. Um, and I actually succeeded in getting her to meditate for two minutes. <laughs> and I was so proud of myself. Uh, and I was proud of her, actually, because she was really hyperactive and I didn't think she could do it. <laughs> um, but she actually did. I got her to meditate for two minutes. Um, so maybe, actually, if I was to say anything, maybe that's the thing, is uh, lower your expectations. Um, so recognize that for, for a young child, that um, practicing meditation for one minute feels like an eternity. As opposed to, for adults, it, it's got to be like three or four minutes before it feels like eternity. <laughs> but otherwise, I don't see why it has to be anything different. It's all the same mind. Uh, underneath the, the layers of body, it's the same mind. And underneath the layers of mind, it's the same formlessness. Uh, so ultimately, I don't see the difference. So, 10 to 14, um, you probably could take that approach, just shorter times and, um, and a little bit slower approach in terms of a little bit less intellectual approach, a little bit more physical approach, starting with mindfulness of body. A um, couple of things that, have, that are fun that I have seen uh, done with younger people, potentially younger than 10, however, is um, there's something called a glitter jar. It's kind of fun. So you, you put some mineral oil in like a ball jar or some kind of jar, and then you put some, some kind of glitter in there or stars or whatever, a little fancy object, shiny, nice shiny object for visual object for the kids, and then you take it and you turn it and ask them to just watch it. Just keep their attention on the, the glitter until it gets to the bottom. That's one thing that's, that's popular. There are, various little, there are various books, actually, for kids, teaching mindfulness to kids in fun ways. Another thing that occurred to me, though, which is, um, so the, if I'm remembering this correctly, one of the metaphors for mindfulness is the watch person at the gate to the city, right? And so the, they don't follow the people who are coming and going, right? The watch person is just watching who's coming in the gate, who's going out the gate, what's going on, is it carts, is it horses, is it people, is it whatever. Um, just this kind of attentiveness, this kind of bare attention. So you could actually set up, right, a kind of game where you had a gate and the kids going in and out and somebody or some folk, or some of them, a group of them, being the watch people right? and asking them, can they just focus on that part, the crossing of the gate, and share how that is, right? share how the mind wants to go and follow them and, or go off to some other thing. Ajahn Brahm tells a funny story about mindfulness. He says, he says, we just have to remember that it doesn't have any kind of moral value to it. It's just an observation capability. So he tells a story about the, the, and 
I don't know if this is canonical, I don't think it is, about the um, guard at the, at the king's house, at the king's castle. And the king comes home and there's, all the furniture is gone. <laughs> and the king says to the guard, well, weren't you being mindful? Were you watching what was going on? And the guard says, oh yeah, I was being quite mindful. I saw that some people came with a truck and I saw that they loaded up the furniture. And then I noticed very carefully that they drove away in the truck. I was being quite mindful. I saw the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm sure there are any number of fun games that you could put together for 10 to 14 year olds about watchfulness. Okay, this one I have to answer. This is not one for Bhante. It says, so far your teachings this retreat have been 99% Theravada. What happened to those 30 years of Zen? <laughs> and to this person I have to say again, like, were you not listening? Because <laughs> let's see, so far we've had teachings from Eihei Dogen, who is the founder of Soto Zen. We've had at least two koans, maybe three, the fox <laughs> koan, the appropriate response. We had the first sit, which I just said a second ago, was a shikantaza sit, or a choiceless awareness sit. Right. Rock your body, get in touch with your six senses, and then perceive what comes into a stream of awareness. So all of that Zen. And I think perhaps the question comes up because there's less difference than you might think in some, in, in between the two traditions. A lot of times I think that we get fooled by the language or the vocabulary or talking about one thing from the side of the negative and the same thing from the side of the positive. Right. So when, when we talk about the teachings of no self, for example, Ajahn Brahm says, Ajahn Brahm does not attain the jhanas, not meaning that it's not possible, but meaning that the sense of this being, of this separate being as an object, is not present when there's that kind of absorption. Or at least that's how I interpret it. And, and that's what Dogen means when he says, don't lose the eye of oneness. Don't lose the eye of oneness. So there are different ways, there are different ways to understand it, but certainly um, 30 years of Zen hasn't gone out of me. There are probably a couple more koans I would throw at you in the next day or so. Although, to be fair, we are talking, I am talking a little bit more uh, about progress on the path than about the side of no progress on the path. So, Both things can be true at the same time. Which is to say that those basic principles of reality, they don't change. They keep working, they keep doing what they're doing all the time. <coughs> So 
So from that perspective, when we talk about the attainments, what we're actually talking about is letting go of delusion, not actually gaining something that you didn't already have. Okay, last question. Okay. This says, I find it much easier to let thoughts float by when I focus my awareness on the sense of hearing. At what point, if any, does this focus hinder meditation? So I do feel, uh, just reflecting on my own practice, um, I do feel that uh, hearing as an object of meditation is very good for developing uh, present moment awareness. Um, it's good for developing mindfulness. Uh, and it can be used as a way of developing the recognition of impermanence which is something I praise a lot, because the Buddha praised it a lot. Uh, but I would also say that it is not particularly good for developing deep concentration. It is not particularly good for developing that, that deep stillness of mind. Um, in my experience, to get true stillness of mind, the object of meditation needs to be still. As still as anything can be, of course, technically nothing is completely still. But generally speaking, the more still an object is, the easier it is to use that object to attain concentration. The more moving, the more the object is in motion or in major change, the harder it is to use it as an object of concentration. That said, things that are obviously moving tend to be easier for developing the recognition of impermanence. Um, so, my inclination actually is to use the, the focus on hearing in the early stages to bring the mind fully into the present moment and to start to habituate the mind with not chasing other things, not chasing thoughts or impulses. Uh, and then when you do start to get to a point where uh, if you feel like you want to go into deep concentration, then uh, just gently shift the mind to an unmoving object. Um, or if you want to develop the recognition of impermanence, then you can stay with sound and just notice that the sound is constantly changing. Um, there's actually a lot of practices you can do with sound. There's also uh, recognizing uh, there is ear, there is sound, there is ear consciousness. These are three distinctly different things. Uh, so when your attention is strong, you can recognize the distinctness of these three phenomena. These are three distinctly separate objects. There's the feeling that arises, which is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. There's the identification of that. For example, saying that as the sound of an airplane. Uh, th these are all distinctly separate mental objects. Uh, and normally it happens so quickly that we don't even notice. We're just like, God, I hate the sound of that plane. And we don't realize that actually there's been five distinct mental objects that have occurred. Five distinct objects. Ear, sound, ear consciousness, feeling, identification. Five separate things. So you can pick apart those five separate things if you like. You can also recognize that the process is occurring without there being a me anywhere in the middle of it. There's one sutta where, where somebody asks the Buddha, who is it that hears? And the Buddha says, that's not a valid question. Mm -hmm. The valid question would be, under what circumstances does hearing arise? So when there is an ear and a sound, then ear consciousness arises. But there's no me in the center of that. There's just 
ear sound, ear consciousness. There's just hearing. Um, the classic sutta on this is the Bahya Sutta, which um, actually the Bahya Sutta is one of the suttas that seems to get quoted the most often in Zen. Um, and it's also quoted very often in Theravada because it's, it's so pointed on this. Um, because the, in it, the Buddha is just saying, like, when there is the herd, let there be just the herd. When there is the scene, let there be just the scene. When there is something sensed, let there be just what is sensed. Um, when you don't add anything extra to that, then there is no me in terms of anything. And just this is the end of suffering. So this is very short, very, I'm paraphrasing, I actually condensed it slightly. This is very short, punchy teaching. And you can actually apply that teaching using mindfulness of sound. But if your attention is all over the place, if your mind is scattered, then it's not going to do you much good. So if your mind is scattered, then you might find it's important to work on developing greater stillness of mind, greater concentration, in which case hearing might not be the best object for that. Those are my thoughts anyway. Yep. Anything? Nope, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to our pile of questions. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you all for your... Pasta recipes, we'll have to wait until tomorrow, I suppose. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit after seven, so we'll take about a, let's say, 15 minutes.